I'm Steve Sable, and this program is about the most distinctive skill in the game of football, and that's the ability to run with the ball. Now, take a group of men, give them a goal, any goal to aim for, and each will have a different idea how to get there. And so it is with pro football's running backs. Each one has a style as distinctive as his signature. Now, the runner whose style that uh, I most admire was Hugh McElhenney, who played for the 49ers in the 1950s. And he once told me a story about a dark alley that he had to pass through as a child to go to the store for his mother. He'd run through it as fast as he could, afraid of the dark places that he couldn't see. And he later likened that experience to running with a football in the NFL. All the great backs seem to have their own alleys of fear. And what we remember about them is their distinct ways of getting through them. It started like the snowflake uh, effect because each one is different, but yet and still, if you look at them from a distance, they all look the same. But then when you start to look closer, then you see that the designs and uh, determination and their desires are totally different, and I think that's what makes it up. All runners follow the same path. But the great ones leave different footprints. They are unique and come in all sizes, shapes, and styles. tackler. Uh, they come at him, uh, challenge him right on, and then seem to make him miss, almost in the narrowest possible way, almost like a bullfighter letting the bull go by in the narrowest margin. The great ones come at you, looks like they're going to take you right on and kind of widen their feet and then go right by you, and go by you so close that, that you can reach out and touch them, but you just can't. The gifted runner creates space where there is none, turning snarled rush hour traffic into high speed expressways. When a guy runs a football, does he finish the run? I mean, does he get every single positive yard that he can out of the run? Defenses try to intimidate running backs. And they do that by not only one guy hitting him, but they try to pile on and get him before he's down to the ground or as he's going down and try to get the extra two or three hits on him. So the determination and the heart of a back for the 60-minute game, I think, is absolutely vital. There's not too many running backs who, once they take a good shot, they keep coming back. And that's, that's my mark of a good running back. Take their best and keep coming back for more. result from either pure will and determination or transcendent physical talent. It is the difference between using a bludgeon or a magic wand. The thing about the back though, if they can make generally on long runs, they've had to make somebody miss because everybody can't be blocked. In the open field, they have to have the ability to, to avoid a man and then run away from him or simply make a guy miss. doesn't run 70 yards for a touchdown, he runs maybe 170 yards for a touchdown. Now he's got that great vision as he sees the field, the defense breaks down maybe in one area, now he goes back against the grain, and it's that area against the defense's pursuit where the big home run is hit. The 
ability that they had was they were able not only to see, they were able to change direction. They were able on a dime to reaccelerate. See, it's the reacceleration you are able to make a separation. And then once they make the separation, they're running north and south and they're in the end zone. My first year, and it was the last game of the year we were playing uh, the uh, New Orleans Saints. I started out to my right, got mixed up, and went back to the left and went back to the right, and then I said, well, I got to start going forward. The great runners want badly to, to run the football. They want the ball. They're angry when you don't give them the footballs. They all have different styles. Running back is the most instinctive position in football, the only one in which a rookie can step in and be an instant success. And it's a position that has attracted a whole character actors guild of different personalities, shapes, sizes, and skills. Now, the eight men who are featured in this film have only one thing in common. They're all great ball carriers. But each achieved stardom and expressed his talent in his own unique way. Let's see how they did it. Let's see how they run. In four years at the University of Pittsburgh, Tony Dorsett, as he was known back then, rushed for more yardage than any man in college football history. In 1976, he won the Heisman Trophy and led Pittsburgh to a national championship. And yet the list of luminaries who came to visit him on the University of Pittsburgh campus discovered he was undergoing an identity crisis. Being Tony Dorsett, they started calling me TD for Tony D and for a touchdown. With your... Tony Dorsett? I thought it was Tony Dorsett. Well, I've changed it to Tony Dorsett. You know, a few months back, I've, I've, I ran into this young man. He, he was calling my name, he was speaking to me as Tony Dorsett, and I liked it. And anyway, Dorsett is supposed to be a French name, and S-E-T-T -T spells set and not sit. So I think that is the correct pronunciation. Fittingly, America's best ever collegiate running back was the top draft choice of America's team. I told him uh, that all the names came out that uh, he wanted to be called Anthony Dorsett, and I said, well, when I won the Heisman Trophy, I wanted to be called Roger Stobach, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, they didn't go along with that in the Navy, but uh, he's uh, he's been kidded a lot about about certain things. But he's he's a fine uh, you know he's a fine guy and he's a great athlete. So it's it's worked out very well so far. And when he, once he starts gaining the yardage, it's going to work out a lot better. As a rookie, he didn't break into the starting lineup until the tenth week of the season. Yet he still managed to establish an assortment of team rushing records with a style destined to make him the game's second all-time leading rusher. A big play guy, the kind of guy that you'll get down in there and get down in there, and then boom, 40 yards, 50 yards. He kind of slips and slides, and then when he sees it, he's gone. He's got that kind of acceleration. Surprisingly enough, he's a better north-south runner than he is east-west runner. Uh, he has great feel and recognition when he heads into the line as an inside runner. But you don't think about him being on your side right because he only weighs 190 pounds. But it's his great acceleration and speed that makes him what he is today. I've got a real unique view of him as a running back. I'm, I mean, a literal view from the football field that not many people get to see. I see him hitting the holes, and I see the holes opening and closing, and I see the kind of adjustments he makes. I might be able to make the same adjustment mentally to do it physically and to be able to combine the two is a tremendous gift and Tony's got that. Blessed with all the physical tools, Tony Dorsett still feels the secret of his success is not his foot speed or his agile open field moves. To Dorsett, success begins with the primary senses, without which all the training and coaching in the world are pointless.
If you ever watch me play, you'll see when I get a ball, my eyes, they light up like silver dollars. And I'm just looking at everything, and, and I do see a lot out there. Running a football is, is, is instinctive. It's all creative, it's all impromptu, and things are happening very, very quick. And my vision helped me, I think, survive in the NFL. Yet, some have questioned where Dorsett's vision leads him. The line on him is the fact that uh, somewhat the same line they had on uh, Franco Harris for so long is that when he got close to the sideline, he'd run out of bounds. I think that's kind of a bad rap because uh, Tony is a powerful runner and he knows when to take a shot and when not to. Now, he's not the kind of runner that's going to run over any, anybody, really, uh, but he breaks a lot of tackles. We hit him, I think, about as hard as you can hit him, and <laughs> he keeps coming back. <laughs> You know, he keeps saying, well, some guys, well, we're going to knock these guys out of there, but hey, you can't knock him out. He's going to come back the next play and may beat you on the very next play. That, he's history against us has been, you stop him, you stop him, you stop him, you stop him, and boom, he's gone for 40 or 50. I'm not a bulldog type of runner. I didn't come into this business being a bulldog type of runner. I'm a runner that you, your grandmother, or someone else could probably enjoy watching because I'm, it's something exciting that's possible to happen at any time on the field. The things that I do, the God-given talents that I have, I think people kind of take them for granted. You know, people kind of say, well, that's, that's just Dorset, you know, that's just his way of doing things. And, and I think probably over the years, uh, I've just been taken for granted. An interesting observation from a man who often leaves entire teams of tacklers floundering in his wake. But when it was first and 99, the Cowboys always knew they were in scoring position. There's a certain magic surrounding Texas Stadium. For 11 seasons, the man who basked in its spotlight was Tony Dorsett. When you look back on it and see Tony Dorsett's name at the top of every running list that was ever compiled, you'll realize how, how great a running back he really was. To see how he runs is to know that Tony Dorsett is truly one of the greatest running backs ever to play pro football. America building gives San Francisco's skyline class and style. The hurtling high kicking knees mark the distinctive style of Roger Craig. The serpentine S turns of famed Lombard Street pale in comparison to the crisscross cutbacks of number 33. Cable cars carry visitors up Market Street to take in the view. And it is Roger Craig who drives his 49ers to Pro Football Summit. Again to Craig, first down, first through 30, to the 40, being chased, the 50, the 40, the 30, the 20, and... Brilliant year, tremendous intensity, tremendous determination, Great enthusiasm for the game of football. Cares so much for all the people around him. He's one of the great people in the league and, to me, the most valuable player. I met with Bill after the last game against Minnesota in the playoffs, and he said I was going to be his halfback for the 1988 season. I wanted to lose 15 pounds. I, I was wearing 225 at the time, and I came in at, at 210, and that really helped my speed and my endurance and, and, and most of all, my conditioning part. So mentally, when I came into the season, I was prepared and ready to uh, be ready for the punishment and just carry on at halfback. Roger is a very fun running back for an offensive line to, to, to block for. And a lot of his highlights haven't come on plays where the uh, defensive 11 has been knocked on their rear ends. I mean, it's come where he's basically run through about nine of the 11, and then, oh, four or five of those nine have gotten another shot at him again the second time around and have to tackle him. Massages soothe the welts on his back, and chiropractors straighten his ravaged body after Sunday's heroics. It's a draw up the middle to Craig, and he breaks loose and runs loose. He gets used to the 30 to the 25. He's out of the 20. Breaks loose again. He's to the 10. Five touchdown 49ers. It might be the best run of his career. And that's highlight reel 
material forever. What makes Roger Craig so special is, is his heart. Um, he plays as if he has a heart of a lion. To me, when a person exudes that on the football field, you have to watch that. You want to see that. He'll knock you out with the knees. He, he kicks him so high, man. I tell you, I hate to come off the block trying to hit him. I never, I've never hit him in his legs, and I never will. But I'll hit him in his chest, I'll hit him around his neck, I'll hit him in his head, but I'll never hit him in his legs. Because he has those knees up so high, but you can hurt yourself. You put your head down there, he can rip your head backwards. Craig is arguably the most versatile back in the game. And each season, he sets his sights on a 1,000 yards receiving and a 1,000 yards rushing. Roger Craig, relentless and resourceful. To see him run is to see someone special indeed. Kettle Falls, Washington is a country mile from the bright lights and big cities of the NFL. It is the home of Richard Post, a man who happily traded in his cleats for horseshoes. There's a real art form for the shoe in itself. You can take an animal that really is not sound and make that horse, after you're done with it, walk off good. Well, there's really a satisfaction with it. 20 years ago, Cowboy Richard Post was Cool Dickie Post, a mod hipster who stood at the center of San Diego's grooviest scene. On this shirt in particular, I just, I dug it when we got it, what, six months ago, whatever it was, a year ago. People just love wearing that type of thing. It's just a good, funky look. It's just a neat, funky shirt. In the funky late 60s, players were not a stylish lot, except for this baby-faced runner with a little boy's name. I was born born Richard M. Post, and the dick is just short for Richard, and that, that fit the style of being a little small running back. Dickie Post kind of had a ring to it. There was a period there at the beginning of artificial turf where I remember specifically looking for guys with a very light feet. Could kind of flit around. He was one of those until he planted the foot and had to go from here to here and then bang. was step, step and a half, I was almost full speed. You're already at top form, and then you're starting to look to where, wherever the daylight is. The open field was the open seas for Dickie Post, and he charted courses only he could navigate. daylight well then that's pretty much where I took it we'd have of course the plays designed to go either left or right or where it was going around in was our was a better one for me than sweeps I was more of a nervous runner paranoid probably it's it's not a style that anybody would want to copy if you can find somebody else it worked for me it consumed so much energy by the by the half I was totally exhausted but it was Post who left tacklers gasping and fans gaping. He was called a water bug, and he skittered across NFL ponds, his stumpy, churning legs making him appear twice as fast as anyone on the field. seen the hounds would never catch this hair, but they began to nip at his heels, then took bites out of his legs. The guy that was an instinctive running back the way that I was, uh, you've got to rely on your instincts. And what I found was starting to happen was that 
my everything would go towards where I thought would go except my body towards the cut or the opening or whatever was there and the old body just refused to go there was so much pain involved in it that and I knew you know the writing was on the wall and so that was that was pretty much the end of my career Although you'll not find Dickie Post's name on best ever lists or in the NFL record book, his running style was as distinctive and his runs were as spectacular as any player in pro football history. distanced himself from pro football faster than he outran defenders, finding more fulfillment away from the field than on it. We'll live as comfortable as we can, take care of business, and raise our little boy, Corey, and just try to enjoy it. Try not to get in too big of a hurry. Just, uh, just enjoy life. The Cleveland Browns appeared to strengthen their kick returning when head coach Blanton Collier selected Leroy Kelly in the NFL draft. It's a funny story about Leroy Kelly in 64. He came in as a seventh round draft choice, I think, from Morgan State. And he's supposed to be able to run a 9-4, 9-500. And no one could understand why he wasn't doing this in exhibition season. He didn't tell anybody. He had two pulled hamstrings. And when they got corrected... I think the first time he felt good, he, that year he became a great punt returner. Kelly may have kept quiet about his injuries, but his special team heroics were hardly a secret. In 1964, he averaged an astonishing 19 yards per return as the Browns rolled to the NFL championship. A year later, Kelly led the league in punt returns. But despite his obvious talent, there was simply no chance he would ever crack the starting lineup. Kelly was doomed to ride the bench because the man ahead of him on the depth chart happened to be the greatest running back of all time, the legendary Jim Brown. But in 1966, Brown shocked the football world when he announced his retirement. Leroy Kelly's time had finally come. When uh, Jim Brown decided to stay in Europe and make a movie instead of coming back to training camp, I talked to Doug Jones, who was backfield coach and a very prominent player with the Browns in the early part of the team, and uh, he said, aren't you really worried about the offense this year? And he said, no. He said, Leroy Kelly is going to be a great back in this league, and it turned out he was. He had gained over 1,000 yards that year. I was pleased to get the opportunity to play, and it was fortunate for me that Jim retired, you know, at an early age in his life, and it gave me the opportunity, and uh, I didn't feel that much pressure. I just uh, felt that I was capable of doing the job, and I did it. Kelly proceeded to lead the ground-oriented Browns in rushing for the next seven years. He averaged nearly five yards per carry, scored 60 touchdowns, and rushed for over 7,000 career yards. Leroy was the type of running back that he had the speed and the agility to fake you out and make you look awful bad, but he also had the power to run you over. So uh, coming up from a defensive back standpoint, he was really a tough runner because you couldn't afford to get into him real hard because he would fake you out. So you kind of had to take a lot of the blows. I think he meant a lot to that Cleveland Brown team at the time. We knew when we played him, he was going to carry the ball 25, 30 times a game. And we just tried to keep him from having any long runs because he would automatically get 100 yards a game if he didn't, if he didn't really control it. I think the thing that Leroy had as a player was his ability to hit a hole 
extremely quick, probably as quick as any running back that I can remember. He could get out of his stance real quick, hit the hole so fast that he was hitting the hole as it was opening. He might have only had a foot of daylight, but as he went into it, the hole opened wider and he would pop through those things and he had the quickness and the speed to run away from people when it, once he got into the secondary. I wanted the ball. I think most backs want to carry the ball 20, 25 times a game. And I think I did a lot of things well, catching the ball, blocking it, and running, you know. And occasionally I threw the pass for a touchdown too. There was nothing that Leroy Kelly could not accomplish on the football field. Where Kelly fell short was in the ability to brag about himself. Leroy Kelly was a quiet man who just did his job, and I, I don't think he's received enough notoriety as one of the all-time great runners. Uh, he was just a quiet person. He was not, never said very much in the huddle, but you could tell when you got in the huddle it's just like he would never say it, you know, I want the ball and I'm, I'm going to do something with it. Although some fans today may not remember Kelly's talents, Leroy's opponents have much clearer memories. Back in the days of the great Cleveland Brown teams, it was just pleasure to play against people like that with great talent. Use your skills against their skills. But I really admire Leroy Kelly and his ability to run with the football. Today, the still modest Kelly is more willing to speak of his achievements. I think that statistically, you know, I feel that I should be in the Hall of Fame. And uh, it's just a matter of time. Whoever does the voting, it's just a matter of time. Leroy Kelly, a quiet man who replaced a legend and in so doing, became a legend himself. The Rams are closing in, and here comes the topper. John Arnett has the ball, and nary a Packer can apply the stopper. Jaguar John opens the Jets and speeds away on a 68-yard play. This ties the score at 24, and you can bet Green Bay will not forget Mr. John Arnett. John played at, at uh, USC when I was in college, and John had the had a great jitterbug type of talent. He could make you miss in a dramatic fashion. He didn't get the football the way that the great tailbacks have gotten it now down through the years, where he could be a great option runner. He got it in close to the line of scrimmage where it was probably more difficult for him to use his skill. But he probably had what I call the Marcus Allen, Kurt Warner type of skill is at the highest level and uh, just a magnificent athlete. Well, John Arnett was definitely one of those kind of backs where many times he used the whole field. The ideal situation is a straight line runner, but John Arnett would probably take a around the, the full course trip to the goal line. I mean, he would run from sideline to sideline many times on a plate. It's always good at dodgeball and all those games you played when, when you're young. And I think it's just something that you do out of instinct. Uh, there are a lot of average backs that have to think about and You can ask them why they cut, and they say, well, I planted my foot and I saw the guy coming. You ask the great backs, they don't even remember it. You know, they just cut because they saw somebody and they cut. And, uh, and I think a style is something that's you. I think a lot of my characteristics came from uh, being a gymnast. From the time I was in the fourth or fifth grade, a tumbler, and uh, so I, I guess a lot of those style was balance, balance and some speed. A number one draft choice in 1957, the versatile Arnett never really became a full-time player in the pros. But as a flanker, running back, and return man, he established himself as one of the most spectacular spot performers of all time. was known as the Jaguar, a tag that seemed appropriate to his sleek running style, but the nickname evolved from a totally different breed of feline. They nicknamed me the Cat, not for the way I run. A lot of people think it was because I ran that way, but I was named uh, the Cat when I was in high school because I could get in a car and go to sleep. You know, wherever we went, I'd put my head down and go to sleep. 
It was actually a promotion-minded L.A. sportscaster who suggested that if the cat became the Jaguar, Arnett might get a free car from the British auto manufacturer. John never got the car, but when he merged into the fast lane of the football field, he drove opponents crazy. In a 1958 contest against the Bears at the Coliseum, Arnett enjoyed his finest day as a pro when his receiving, running, and return skills netted 298 combined yards. Yet amazingly, Arnett never scored a touchdown in the game. Something that was duly noted by a man he would eventually play for, Bears coach George Hallis. I think I returned a punt 80 or 90 yards and a screen pass 80 yards. And from the line of scrimmage, I had an 80-yard run and didn't score on any of them. I caught on the two, three, four-yard line. And I was with the Bears later. I was always coming in around 205 pounds. And he wanted me to play at 198, and he finds you if you don't. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, when I played with the Rams against you, I was weighing 205 pounds. He said, yeah, but you never scored. <laughs> The Jaguar may not have impressed Papa Bear, but in the NFL jungle, he was a top cat who was voted to five straight Pro Bowls. Jaguar, John Arnett. When fans saw how he ran, they saw one of the most breathtaking broken field runners to ever play the game. capacity for seeing things that other runners were unable to see. He had the equivalent of what the military calls night vision, and he moved with such effortless grace and nonchalance that even his own teammates were in awe of his talent. He was my inspiration. He was an idol almost to me because I used to look forward to going to practice to watch him run. He was so smooth, he could lay his feet down and walk on eggs without breaking them. And he would stop on a dime. He would set the blocker up for you. As a runner, he had to be one of the most fluid, coordinated. Uh, he probably had the sixth sense. Anytime somebody would get close to him, he just knew how to cut. And uh, fluid, he, he was like um, a symphony on the football field. Every time Lenny Moore was given the ball, it was the beginning of a unique adventure, a classic in cleats. pound for pound, the best offensive weapon, scoring weapon that I've ever seen. Plus, Lenny Moore was a, a real team player. He was a humble guy. Lenny learned the true meaning of humility from his mother, who worked as a housemaid while he attended school. I remember one day when I was at uh, Penn State, I came home and I rode up together and I parked the car, and of course, inside here, I said, oh, wow, you know, that mom's, you know, scrubbing floors, and, you know, whatever, you know. Went up, I rapped on the door, and the lady came to the door. I said, uh, is, uh, come to see uh, Mrs. Moore. I said, I'm her son. 
Oh, you must be Lenny. You know, you're home from school? I said, yes. Okay, fine, I'll get her. And boy, something went through me. Yeah, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I got in that car and I prayed to God. I said, Lord, if you ever make it possible for me to do anything that my mother will never scrub another floor. And I cried, boy, and then she came out, you know, and I straightened myself out. Lenny's desire to succeed resulted in many great plays, but none as memorable as this catch against the Detroit Lions. I felt a glow come over my body. And it's hard to describe, and it was good Lord. A glow came over my body. I dove, that ball stuck. I pulled the ball to my stomach as I slid into the end zone, you know, through the end zone. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. After five years as an all-pro, Lenny's glow of success faded into the shadows of complacency. His instant fame had dulled his desire and softened his will to work. His play was marred by fumbles, mistakes, and poorly run pass patterns. You know, Lenny was a great talent, natural. He never had had to work much for it. And he was careless. And he had a couple of bad experiences fumbling. Probably cost us a division championship one year. There was no place on Don Shula's Colts for a player whose talent was no longer as large as his scrapbook. And in 1963, Lenny Moore's career seemed over. I dedicated myself in 1964. I said, well, if they think I'm through, I'm going to show them that I'm not through. And I'm going to have the best year I've ever had because it's going to start from day one. My attitude changed and my dedication was toward proving that I was still there, that I could still do the job. The magic was gone, but the will, the desire, returned. season more remained a persistent heroic presence a determined relentless competitor who never stopped trying even as a 31 year old member of the special teams Moore scored a record 20 touchdowns led the league in scoring and the Colts won the championship for the Western Conference season's end, Moore was again an all-pro. He received the Comeback Player of the Year award and was voted the most valuable player in the NFL. But Lenny Moore had another reason to savor the season of 64. His success erased a debt to his own pride, and three years later, he retired certain of his place in the game's history. Ricky Bell continued the glorious tradition of the USC tailback, a position like center field for the Yankees that is held in reverence. Number 42 surpassed the achievements of Mike Garrett, Anthony Davis, and even O.J. Simpson. Along the way, he stood taller, played harder, and became the mightiest Trojan of them all. We used to run uh, on the beach and in and, and combat boots. 
there was the sand right next to the water, and then there was the heavy sand, and we'd run from pier to pier. I mean, the boots was hard enough, and the sand was is doubly hard. I would run right next to the water, which was hard, but Ricky would run in the deep sand and beat me to the pier. I mean, smoke me. I mean, he was... He just had this force within him that you really don't see in, in a normal person. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers select as the first selection in the first round, Ricky Bell, fullback, University of Southern California. The Buccaneers had lost all 14 games in their expansion season in 76, and Coach John McKay had brought so many of his former Southern Cal players in here, and the Tampa became known as Southern Cal East. When they had the opportunity to draft Tony Dorsett out of Pittsburgh and instead took Ricky Bell, a Southern Cal player, Ricky was off to a bad start as in strike number one. Ricky's first two seasons were disasters. Not only did he fail to elevate the lowly box, he was deemed personally responsible for their failure. It was hard for him to understand why people were so down on him. I think he took some of that to heart when it was basically meant to be me. Ricky was out there playing, and they couldn't really get to me that often, and they took it out on Ricky. Some fans gathered behind the bench and began to berate Ricky Bell personally. He took it as long as he could stand it, and he headed towards the stands. Several players had to restrain him. Buried by his critics in a shallow grave, Ricky Bell resurrected his career in 1979 and led the Buccaneers to a title. just something about his countenance that made everybody think he was special. He treated everybody special, and yet he'd walk on a football field and become a, an extremely violent, uh, aggressive runner. He'd knock you down and run over you and then come back and help you up. He ran so hard that he grunted when he ran. Huh, huh, huh. If you were deaf, you could hear him coming finally demonstrated why he was chosen first in the 1977 draft. He carried defenders almost 1,300 yards, lifted the Bucks to the NFC Central Championship, and to the brink of the Super Bowl in 1979. But a storybook that began with a honeymoon with Buck fans on the field and a marriage offer concluded with a horrifying final chapter. The next year, we, um, we were not anyways near as good, but he couldn't play very often. He would get an injury, and where he might be out a day or two, he'd be out two or three weeks. I didn't know the reason why. The trainer and the doctor didn't know the reason why. I summed it up and says, Ricky Bell would like to be on the West Coast. I'm going to put him there. Traded to the Chargers in 1982, Bell, number 42, played little. Always sick or injured, it was discovered he had contracted a rare skin and muscle disease called dermatomyositis. Probably 90% of people have a normal lifespan with this disease. Ricky's condition caused inflammation of the muscles of the heart which occurs in probably less than 5% of cases, and this was distinctly unusual. He had a certain sense of peace with it, that he was struggling with it, he knew that we could only do so much, and he really never let this on to people around him. He was a positive, energetic soul. On November 28, 1984, the mightiest Trojan lost the one fight he never had a chance to win. You know, he was a genuinely good person. You know, nobody, nobody ever had nothing bad to say about Ricky. Just a great person. And you know, it's easy to sit back when somebody's passed away and talk about how great he was, but I thought this at the time about Ricky. Probably the kindest, gentlest football player that I've ever been around. I think he had a, a sense about him that just made everybody love him. I, I loved him, and I thought he was a great player. 
knew how to do everything right. Uh, I wish there were a lot more Rickies. He's gone, but his memory lives on and is strong. When things get bad, I just look at how bad things were him right before he died. He never complained. You know, he was uh, he was the kind of guy just I don't know. He was he was a once in a lifetime person. He was a one in a million. You know, he was a one in a million guy. military engine anciently used to beat down walls of besieged palaces was a large beam with a head of iron that resembled the head. Earl Campbell, he was such a physical football player. Any time that anybody ever hit Earl Campbell, it always hurt them a lot worse than it hurt Earl Campbell. He was the hitter. The other people were the ones that got the hit. Just a very, very powerful physical football player that could run over tacklers, always going toward the goal line. He was a true north-south runner. You just could not tackle him with a hand or an arm now. You can forget that. In fact, you couldn't tackle him with a shoulder a lot of times, unless you had two or three sets of shoulders. He'd break in the open. He'd look somebody up to run over rather than look somebody up to dodge. I knew what was going to happen, and they knew what was going to happen. And they knew that if it wasn't like six of them, or four or five maybe, he's going to go because he ain't going to quit. Kind of girlish for one guy to tackle me. I mean, I wanted to have a bunch of them. Earl Campbell proved what an irresistible force does to immovable objects. We played Washington one year. I wish you'd look the film up or get somebody to look it up. He made a nine-yard touchdown run, and I swear I believe seven people hit him in that nine yards. It was, it was the best run I ever saw him make. Picking the best Campbell collision was like choosing the best Mike Tyson knockout. Was it butting heads with the Raiders' Jack Tatum? Or trampling the Rams' Isaiah Robertson? You hit that guy Isaiah right, he ain't gonna wanna play football. And I could not believe just for a second that he planned on tackling me standing that tall. So I figured the best thing to do is put my head down. He fell. I kept running. While no one ever finished off a play like Campbell, there was one thing he never finished. Hell, I don't believe he ever finished a mile run, but I've never seen a football field a mile long, so it didn't bother me. Uh, on fourth and a mile, we wasn't gonna give him the ball. Campbell gained over five miles during his career, a grueling body of road work that produced admirers of his stamina. He was just a great player and had a, a huge heart. Control the game on my fence and uh, eat up uh, four or five minutes of the clock and carry the ball 10, 15 times in a row, and the 15th time would be just as hard as the first. It was his 38th carry of the ball game, and we were ahead. All we wanted to do was make a first down and run the clock out. They are on their and we gave him a routine pitch out, and he went around the end and ran 89 yards with all the secondary people were chasing him. And they're fast kids, but they couldn't catch him. At the 50, he may go. He ran 89 yards on the 38th carry of the ball game. That gives you an idea of his stamina. On every team he ever played on, Earl Campbell has been the centerpiece. A Heisman Trophy winner at Texas, he was known as the Tyler Rose, a tribute to his hometown's most famous product. Campbell works in the athletic department at his alma mater, where his celebrity is widespread and where the man of stone has been cast in concrete as a Texas legend. If I held a board meeting, I'd have empty chairs because I'm the only one living. 
and the other guys are all dead. Sam Houston, David Crockett, and Stephen F. Austin. <laughs> Campbell was to power running what the wrecking ball was to demolition. Both hit things and things collapsed. We've just seen eight men, all of whom played the same position. Some played on championship teams, some didn't. Some of their names are still in the record book, but most of their records have been surpassed. But what remains engraved in our memory is the lasting image of how they played the game. We know we saw how they ran. <laughs> 